This audio case is brought to you by Laudio. Walta versus Conta Commodity Services Incorporated, 1996. Famed silver trader Norton Waltuk spent $2.2 million in unreimbursed legal fees to defend himself against numerous civil lawsuits and an enforcement proceeding brought by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, CFTC. In this action under Delaware law, Waltuk seeks indemnification of his legal expenses from his former employer. The district court denied any indemnity, and Waltuk appeals. As vice president and chief metals trader for Conta Commodity Services Incorporated, Waltuk traded silver for the firm's clients, as well as for his own account. In late 1979 and early 1980, the silver price spiked upward as the then billionaire Hunt brothers and several of Waltuk's foreign clients bought huge quantities of silver futures contracts. Just as rapidly, the price fell until on a day remembered in trading circles as Silver Thursday, the silver market crashed. Between 1981 and 1985, angry silver speculators filed numerous lawsuits against Waltuk and Conta Commodity, alleging fraud, market manipulation, and antitrust violations. All of the suits eventually settled and were dismissed with prejudice pursuant to settlements in which Conta Commodity paid over $35 million to the various suitors. Waltuk himself was dismissed from the suits with no settlement contribution. His unreimbursed legal expenses in these actions total approximately $1.2 million. Waltuk was also the subject of an enforcement proceeding brought by the CFTC, charging him with fraud and market manipulation. The proceeding was settled with Waltuk agreeing to a penalty that included a $100,000 fine and a six-month ban on buying or selling futures contracts from any exchange floor. Waltuk spent $1 million in unreimbursed legal fees in the CFTC proceeding. Waltuk brought suit in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York against Conta Commodity and its parent company, Continental Grain Company together Conti, for indemnification of his unreimbursed expenses. Only two of Waltuk's claims reach us on appeal. Waltuk first claims that Article 9th of Conta Commodities Articles of Incorporation requires Conti to indemnify him for his expenses in both the private and CFTC actions. Conti responds that this claim is barred by subsection A of section 145 of Delaware's general corporation law, which permits indemnification only if the corporate officer acted, quote, in good faith, unquote, something that Waltuk has not established. Waltuk counters that subsection F of the same statute permits a corporation to grant indemnification rights outside the limits of subsection A, and that Conta Commodity did so with Article 9th, which has no stated good faith limitation. The district court held that, notwithstanding Section 145F, Waltuk could recover under Article 9th only if Waltuk met the good faith requirement of Section 145A. On the factual issue of whether Waltuk had acted in good faith, the court denied Conti's summary judgment motion and cleared the way for trial. The parties then stipulated that they would forego trial on the issue of Waltuk's good faith agree to an entry of final judgment against Waltuk on his claim under Article 9th and Section 145F, and allow Waltuk to take an immediate appeal of the judgment to this court. Thus, as to Waltuk's first claim, the only question left is how to interpret Sections 145A and 145F, assuming Waltuk acted with less than good faith. As we explain in Part 1 below, we affirm the district court's judgment as to this claim and hold that section 145F does not permit a corporation to bypass the good faith requirement of 145A. Waltuk's second claim is that subsection C of section 145 requires Conti to indemnify him because he was, quote, successful on the merits or otherwise, end quote, in the private lawsuits.
the district court ruled for Conti on this claim as well. The court explained that even though all the suits against Waltuk were dismissed without his making any payment, he was not, quote, successful on the merits or otherwise, end quote, because Conti's settlement payments to the plaintiffs were partially on Waltuk's behalf. For the reasons stated in part two below, we reverse this portion of the district court's ruling and hold that Conti must indemnify Waltuk under section 145C for the $1.2 million in unreimbursed legal fees he spent in defending the private lawsuits. Article 9th, on which Waltuk bases his first claim, is categorical and contains no requirement of good faith. Quote, the corporation shall indemnify and hold harmless each of its incumbent or former directors, officers, employees, and agents against expenses actually and necessarily incurred by him in connection with the defense of any action, suit, or proceeding, threatened, pending, or completed, in which he is made a party by reason of his serving in or having held such position or capacity except in relation to matters as to which he shall be adjudged in such action, suit, or proceeding to be liable for negligence or misconduct in the performance of duty, end quote. Conti argues that section 145A of Delaware's general corporation law, which does contain a good faith requirement, fixes the outer limits of a corporation's power to indemnify. Article 9th is thus invalid under Delaware law, says Conti, to the extent that it requires indemnification of officers who have acted in bad faith. The affirmative grant of power in section 145A is as follows, quote, a corporation shall have power to indemnify any person who was or is a party or is threatened to be made a party to any threatened, pending or completed action, suit or proceeding, whether civil criminal, administrative, or investigative, other than an action by or in the right of the corporation, by reason of the fact that he is or was a director, officer, employee, or agent of the corporation, or is or was serving at the request of the corporation as a director, officer, employee, or agent of another corporation, partnership, joint venture, trust, or other enterprise against expenses, including attorney's fees, judgments, fines, and amounts paid in settlement actually and reasonably incurred by him in connection with such an action, suit, or proceeding. If he had acted in good faith and in a manner he reasonably believed to be in or not opposed to the best interests of the corporation and, with respect to any criminal action or proceeding, had no reasonable cause to believe his conduct was unlawful." End quote. In order to escape the good faith clause of section 145A, Waltuk argues that section 145A is not an exclusive grant of indemnification power because section 145F expressly allows corporations to indemnify officers in a manner broader than that set out in section 145A. The non-exclusivity language of section 145F provides, quote, the indemnification and advancement of expenses provided by or granted pursuant to the other subsections of this section shall not be deemed exclusive of any other rights to which those seeking indemnification or advancement of expenses may be entitled under any bylaw, agreement, vote of stockholders, or disinterested directors or otherwise, both as to action in his official capacity and as to action in another capacity while holding such office. End quote. Waltuk contends that the non-exclusivity language in section 145F is a separate grant of indemnification power, not limited by the good faith clause that governs the power granted in section 145A. Conti, on the other hand, contends that section 145F must be limited by, quote, public policies, end quote, one of which is that a corporation may indemnify its officers only if they act in good faith. In a thorough and scholarly opinion, Judge Lasker agreed with Conti's reading of section 145F, writing that, quote, 
It has been generally agreed that there are public policy limits on indemnification under Section 145F, end quote, although it was, quote, difficult to define precisely what limitations on indemnification public policy imposes, end quote. After reviewing cases from Delaware and elsewhere and finding that they provided no authoritative guidance, Judge Lasker surveyed the numerous commentators on this issue and found that they generally agreed with Conti's position. He also found that Waltuck's reading of Section 145F failed to make sense of the statute as a whole. Quote, There would be no point to the carefully crafted provisions of Section 145F spelling out the permissible scope of indemnification under Delaware law if subsection F allowed indemnification in additional circumstances without regard to these limits. The exception would swallow the rule." End quote. The fact that section 145F was limited by section 145A did not make 145F meaningless, wrote Judge Lasker, because 145F, quote, still may authorize the adoption of various procedures and presumptions to make the process of indemnification more favorable to the indemnity without violating the statute, end quote. As will be evident from the discussion below, we adopt much of Judge Lasker's analysis. Section A, Delaware Cases. No Delaware court has decided the very issue presented here but the applicable cases tend to support the proposition that a corporation's grant of indemnification rights cannot be inconsistent with the substantive statutory provisions of Section 145, notwithstanding Section 145F. We draw this rule of consistency primarily from our reading of the Delaware Supreme Court's opinion in Hibbert v. Hollywood Park Incorporated, 1983. In that case, Hibbert and certain other directors sued the corporation and the remaining directors and then demanded indemnification for their expenses and fees related to the litigation. The company refused indemnification on the ground that the directors were entitled to indemnification only as defendants in legal proceedings. The court reversed the trial court and held that Hibbert was entitled to indemnification under plain terms of a company bylaw that did not draw an express distinction between plaintiff directors and defendant directors. The court then proceeded to test the bylaw for consistency with section 145A. Quote, furthermore, indemnification here is consistent with current Delaware law. Under Delaware code, Title VIII, Section 145A, a corporation may indemnify any person who was or is a party or is threatened to be made a party to any threatened, pending, or completed derivative or third-party action. By this language, indemnity is not limited to only those who stand as a defendant in the main action. The corporation can also grant indemnification rights beyond those provided by statute." End quote. This passage contains two complementary propositions. Under section 145F, a corporation may provide indemnification rights that go beyond the rights provided by section 145A and the other substantive subsections of section 145. At the same time, any such indemnification rights provided by a corporation must be consistent with the substantive provisions of section 145, including section 145A. In Hibbert, the corporate bylaw was consistent with section 145A because this subsection was not limited to suits in which directors were defendants. Hibbert's holding may support an inverse corollary that illuminates our case. If section 145A had been expressly limited to directors who were named as defendants, the bylaw could not have stood regardless of section 145F because the bylaw would not have been consistent with the substantive statutory provision. A more recent opinion of the Delaware Supreme Court analyzing a different provision of section 145 also supports the view that the express limits in section 145 substantive provisions are not subordinated to section 145F. In Citadel Holding Corporation versus Rovin, 1992, 
A corporation's bylaws provided indemnification, quote, to the full extent permitted by the general corporation law of Delaware, end quote. The corporation entered into an indemnification agreement with one of its directors, reciting the party's intent to afford enhanced protection in some unspecified way. The director contended that the argument was intended to afford mandatory advancement of expenses and that this feature, when compared with the merely permissive advancement provision of Section 145E, was the enhancement intended by the parties. The corporation, seeking to avoid advancement of expenses, argued instead that the agreement enhanced the director's protection only in the sense that the pre-contract indemnification rights were subject to statute whereas his rights under the contract could not be diminished without his consent. In rejecting that argument, the court explained that indemnification rights provided by contract could not exceed the scope of a corporation's indemnification powers as set out by the statute. Quote, if the General Assembly were to amend Delaware's director indemnification statute, with the effect of curtailing the scope of indemnification a corporation may grant a director, the fact that the director's rights were also secured by contract would be of little use to him. Private parties may not circumvent the legislative will simply by agreeing to do so." End quote. Citadel thus confirms the dual propositions stated in Hibbert. Indemnification rights may be broader than those set out in the statute but they cannot be inconsistent with the scope of the corporation's power to indemnify as delineated in the statute's substantive provisions. Section B, statutory reading. The consistency rule suggested by these Delaware cases is reinforced by our reading of section 145 as a whole. Subsections A, indemnification for third party actions and B, similar indemnification for derivative suits, expressly grant a corporation the power to indemnify directors, officers, and others if they, quote, acted in good faith and in a manner reasonably believed to be in or not opposed to the best interest of the corporation, end quote. These provisions thus limit the scope of the power that they confer. They are permissive in the sense that a corporation may exercise less than its full power to grant the indemnification rights set out in these provisions. By the same token, subsection F permits the corporation to grant additional rights. The rights provided in the rest of section 145, quote, shall not be deemed exclusive of any other rights to which those seeking indemnification may be entitled, end quote. But crucially, Subsection F merely acknowledges that one seeking indemnification may be entitled to other rights of indemnification or otherwise. It does not speak in terms of corporate power and therefore cannot be read to free a corporation from the good faith limit explicitly imposed in subsections A and B. An alternative construction of these provisions would effectively force us to ignore certain explicit terms of the statute. Section 145A gives Conti the power to indemnify Waltuk, quote, if he acted in good faith and in a manner reasonably believed to be in or not opposed to the best interests of the corporation, end quote. This statutory limit must mean that there is no power to indemnify Waltuk if he did not act in good faith. Otherwise, as Judge Lasker pointed out, Section 145A and its good faith clause would have no meaning. A corporation could indemnify whomever and however it wished, regardless of the good faith clause or anything else the Delaware legislator wrote into section 145A. When the legislature intended a subsection of section 145 to augment the powers limited in subsection A, it set out the additional powers expressly. Thus, subsection G explicitly allows a corporation to circumvent the good faith clause of subsection A by purchasing a director's and officer's liability insurance policy. Significantly, that subsection is framed as a grant of corporate power. Quote, a corporation shall have power to purchase and maintain insurance on behalf of any person who is or was a director, officer, employee, or agent of the corporation against any liability asserted against him and incurred by him in any such capacity,
or arising out of his status as such. Whether or not the corporation would have the power to indemnify him against such liability under this section. End quote. The italicized passage reflects the principle that corporations have the power under section 145 to indemnify in some situations and not in others. Since section 145F is neither a grant of corporate power nor a limitation on such power, Subsection G must be referring to the limitations set out in Section 145A and the other provisions of Section 145 that describe corporate power. If Section 145 through Subsection F or another part of the statute gave corporations unlimited power to indemnify directors and officers, then the final clause of Subsection G would be unnecessary. That is, its grant of quote, power to purchase and maintain insurance, end quote, exercisable regardless of whether the corporation itself would have the power to indemnify the loss directly, is meaningful only because in some insurable situations, the corporation simply lacks the power to indemnify its directors and officers directly. A contemporaneous account from the principal drafter of the Delaware's general corporation law confirms what an integral reading of section 145 demonstrates. The statute's affirmative grants of power also impose limitations on the corporation's power to indemnify. Specifically, the good faith clause, unchanged since the law's original enactment in 1967, was included in subsections A and B as a carefully calculated improvement on the prior indemnification provision and as an explicit limit on a corporation's power to indemnify. Quote, During the three years of the revision committee's study, no subject was more discussed among members of the corporate bar than the subject of indemnification of officers and directors. As far as Delaware law was concerned, the existing statutory provision on the subject had been found inadequate. Numerous bylaws and charter provisions had been adopted clarifying and extending its terms, but uncertainty existed in many instances as to whether such provisions transgressed the limits which the courts had indicated they would establish based on public policy. It was apparent that revision was appropriate with respect to the limitations which must necessarily be placed on the power to indemnify in order to prevent the statute from undermining the substantive provisions of the criminal law and corporation law. There was a need for a provision to protect the corporation law's requirement of loyalty to the corporation. Ultimately, it was decided that the power to indemnify should not be granted unless it appeared that the person seeking indemnification had acted in good faith and in a manner reasonably believed to be in or not opposed to the best interests of the corporation. End quote. This passage supports Hibbert's rule of consistency and makes clear that a corporation has no power to transgress the indemnification limits set out in the substantive provisions of section 145. Waltuck argues at length that reading section 145A to bar the indemnification of officers who acted in bad faith would render section 145F meaningless. This argument misreads section 145F. That subsection refers to, quote, any other rights to which those seeking indemnification or advancement of expenses may be entitled, end quote. Delaware commentators have identified various indemnification rights that are beyond those provided by statute and that are at the same time consistent with the statute. Quote, subsection F provides general authorization for the adoption of various procedures and presumptions, making the process of indemnification more favorable to the indemnity. For example, indemnification agreements or bylaws could provide for one, mandatory indemnification unless prohibited by statute, two, mandatory advancement of expenses, which the indemnity can in many instances obtain on demand, three, Accelerated procedures for the determination required by section 145D to be made in the specific case. Four, litigation appeal rights of the indemnity in the event of an unfavorable determination. Five, 
Procedures under which a favorable determination will be deemed to have been made under circumstances where the board fails or refuses to act. And six, reasonable funding mechanisms, end quote. Moreover, subsection F may reference non-indemnification rights, such as advancement rights, or rights to other payments from the corporation that do not qualify as indemnification. We need not decide in this case the precise scope of those other rights adverted to in section 145F. We simply conclude that section 145F is not rendered meaningless or inoperative by the conclusion that a Delaware corporation lacks power to indemnify an officer or director unless he acted in good faith and in a manner reasonably believed to be in or not opposed to the best interests of the corporation. As a result, we hold that Conti's Article 9, which would require indemnification of Walchuk even if he acted in bad faith, is inconsistent with Section 145A and thus exceeds the scope of the Delaware corporation's power to indemnify. Since Walchuk has agreed to forego his opportunity to prove at trial that he acted in good faith, he is not entitled to indemnification under Article 9 for the $2.2 million he spent in connection with the private lawsuits and the CFTC proceeding. We therefore affirm the district court on this issue. Section 2. Unlike Section 145A, which grants a discretionary indemnification power, Section 145C affirmatively requires corporations to indemnify its officers and directors for the successful defense of certain claims. Quote, to the extent that a director, officer, employee, or agent of a corporation has been successful on the merits or otherwise in defense of any action, suit, or proceeding referred to in subsections A and B of this section, or in defense of any claim, issue, or matter therein, he shall be indemnified against expenses, including attorney's fees, actually and reasonably incurred by him in connection therewith." End quote. Waltuk argues that he was successful on the merits or otherwise in the private lawsuits because they were dismissed with prejudice without any payment or assumption of liability by him. Conti argues that the claims against Waltuk were dismissed only because of Conti's $35 million settlement payments and that this payment was contributed in part on behalf of Waltuk. The district court agreed with Conti that, quote, the successful settlements cannot be credited to Waltuk but are attributable solely to Conti's settlement payments. It was not Waltuk who was successful, but Conti who was successful for him, end quote. The district court held that section 145C mandates indemnification when the director or officer is vindicated, but that there was no vindication here, quote, Vindication is also ordinarily associated with a dismissal with prejudice without any payment. However, a director or officer is not vindicated when the reason he did not have to make a settlement payment is because someone else assumed that liability. Being bailed out is not the same thing as being vindicated. End quote. We believe that this understanding and application of the vindication concept is overly broad and is inconsistent with a proper interpretation of Section 145C. No Delaware court has applied Section 145C in the context of indemnification stemming from the settlement of civil litigation. One lower court, however, has applied that subsection to an analogous case in the criminal context and has illuminated the link between vindication and the statutory phrase, successful on the merits or otherwise. In Merritt, Chapman and Scott Corporation versus Wolfson, 1974, the corporation's agents were charged with several counts of criminal conduct. A jury found them guilty on some counts, but deadlocked on the others. The agents entered into a settlement with the prosecutor's office by pleading no low contendere to one of the counts in exchange for the dropping of the rest. The agents claimed entitlement to mandatory indemnification under section 145C as to the counts that were dismissed. In opposition, the corporation raised an argument similar to the argument raised by Conti. Quote, the corporation argues that the statute and sound public policy require indemnification only where there has been vindication by a finding or concession of innocence. <laughs> 
It contends that the charges against the agents were dropped for practical reasons, not because of their innocence. The statute requires indemnification to the extent that the claimant has been successful on the merits or otherwise. Success is vindication. In a criminal action, any result other than conviction must be considered success. Going behind the result, as the corporation attempts, is neither authorized by subsection C nor consistent with the presumption of innocence." End quote. Although the underlying proceeding in merit was criminal, the court's analysis is instructive here. The agents in merit rendered consideration, their guilty plea on one count, to achieve the dismissal of the other counts. The court considered these dismissals both success and therefore vindication, and refused to go behind the result or to appraise the reason for the success. In equating success with vindication, the court thus rejected the more expansive view of vindication urged by the corporation. Under Merritt's holding, then, vindication, when used as a synonym for success under Section 145C, does not mean moral exoneration. Escape from an adverse judgment or other detriment, for whatever reason, is determinative. According to Merritt, the only question a court may ask is what the result was, not why it was. Conti's contention that, because of its $35 million settlement payments, Walt took settlement without payment should not really count as settlement without payment is inconsistent with the rule in merit. Here, Waltuk was sued and the suit was dismissed without his having paid a settlement. Under the approach taken in merit, it is not our business to ask why this result was reached. Once Waltuk achieved his settlement gratis, he achieved a success on the merits or otherwise. And as we know from merit, success is sufficient to constitute vindication, at least for the purposes of section 145C. Walt Tuck's settlement thus vindicated him. The concept of vindication pressed by Conti is also inconsistent with the fact that a director or officer who is able to defeat an adversary's claim by asserting a technical defense is entitled to indemnification under Section 145C. In such cases, the indemnity has been successful in the palpable sense that he has won and the suit has been dismissed whether or not the victory is deserved in merit's terms. If a technical defense is deemed vindication under Delaware law, it cannot matter why Waltuk emerged unscathed, or whether Conti bailed him out, or whether his success was deserved. Under Section 145C, mere success is vindication enough. This conclusion comports with the reality that civil judgments and settlements are ordinarily expressed in terms of cash rather than moral victory. No doubt it would make sense for Conti to buy the dismissal of the claims against Waltuk along with its own discharge from the case, perhaps to avoid further expense or participation as a non-party, potential cross-claims, or negative publicity. But Waltuk apparently did not accede to that arrangement, and Delaware law cannot allow an indemnifying corporation to escape the mandatory indemnification of subsection C by paying the sum in settlement on behalf of an unwilling indemnity. We note that two non-Delaware precedents, one from this court, support our conclusion. In Weisner v. Air Express International Corporation, 1978, we construed an Illinois indemnification statute that was intentionally enacted as a copy of Delaware's Section 145. Our holding in that case is perfectly applicable here. Quote, it is contended that the director was not successful in the litigation since the third party claims against him never proceeded to trial. The statute, however, refers to success on the merits or otherwise, which surely is broad enough to cover a termination of claims by agreement without any payment or assumption of liability." End quote. It is undisputed that the private lawsuits against Conti and Waltuk were dismissed with prejudice without any payment of assumption of liability by Waltuk. Applying the analysis of Weisner, Conti must indemnify Waltuk for his expenses in connection with the private lawsuits. The second case from the Eastern District of Pennsylvania is almost on point. In B&B Investment Club versus Kleinerts Incorporated, 1979, suit had been brought against a corporation and two of its officers. The corporation settled the suit against it on unspecified terms. One of the officers, Stevens, settled by paying $35,000 and the other, Brubaker, settled without paying anything. <laughs> 
Brubaker claimed indemnification under a Pennsylvania statute that was virtually identical to Section 145C, as the court noted. The corporation argued that Brubaker was not successful in the merits or otherwise because the settlement was achieved only as a result of Stevens' $35,000 payment. The court rejected this argument, explaining that, quote, Brubaker is entitled to indemnification because he made no monetary payment and the case was dismissed with prejudice as to him, end quote. Even though there was evidence that the plaintiffs dismissed their claims against Brubaker only because of Stevens' payment, this payment was irrelevant to the determination of success. Quote, that the class plaintiffs at one point in the negotiations saw a cash payment from Brubaker but later settled with him for no monetary consideration does not render Brubaker any less successful than the plaintiff in Weisner, nor is the extent of Brubaker's success affected by Stevens having paid sufficient consideration to enable Brubaker to negotiate a dismissal with prejudice without making any payment. In short, Brubaker was successful on the merits or otherwise. End quote. The same logic applies to our case. The extent of Waltuk's success is not lessened by Conti's payments, even if it is true, as it stands to reason, that his success was achieved because Conti was willing to pay. Whatever the impetus for the plaintiff's dismissal of their claims against Waltuk, he still walked away without liability and without making a payment. This constitutes a success that is untarnished by the process that achieved it. For all these reasons, we agree with Waltuk that he is entitled to indemnification under Section 145C for his expenses pertaining to the private lawsuits. Section 3. The judgment of the district court is affirmed in part and reversed in part. This case is remanded to the district court so that judgment may be entered in favor of Waltuk on his claim for $1,228,586.67, representing the unreimbursed expenses from the private lawsuits. For more audio cases, visit us at laudioforlisteners.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel.